Stated in the SOE guidelines, the state ownership policy should fully recognize SOE's responsibilities towards the stakeholder and request that SOEs report on their relations with stakeholders. It should make clear any expectation that a state has regarding responsible business conduct by SOEs. In this context, the parchment of the session are invited to identify actionable ways in which governments as shareholder in SOEs can link the government of SOEs with creating value for citizens. The panelists will discuss the government's challenge as well as the best practices in supporting responsible business conduct in SOEs. It's a privilege to have Dr. Gambhir Bhatt as moderator, who is advisor, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, is head of Knowledge Sharing and Service Center in Asian Development Bank. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shi Yong Song, head of Evaluation Research Team, Research Center for State-Owned Entities, Korea Institute of Public Finance. Mr. R. Vikram, Director, HR, NLC India Limited. And Ms. Ya M. Shoi, Head, Corporate Governance Division, Security Issuance Supervision, Department, Securities and Exchange Commission of Cambodia, will be the key speaker of the session. Uh, I would like to hand over the session to our moderator. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I know this is the session after lunch where, unless we make it really interesting, uh, you might just not really be very much into this. Let me briefly introduce myself and the, and the subject matter itself, and I'm really happy that we have uh, a group of um, experts with us that have actually looked at this issue in a very substantive way. Um, I'm right now based in the Asian Development Bank in Manila. I've been there for 14 years. Um, Prior to this particular role as an advisor in the uh, in the ADB, um, I used to head the governance group uh, uh, in ADB. Uh, and one main component of that work was to chair the SOE working group. Um, ADB has substantial investments in SOEs in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, in from 2005 to 2017, we've had about 41, 42 billion dollars in loans and investments in the area of sustainable uh, in, in state-owned enterprises, and about. $200 million or so in technical assistance. So it's an area of work that is very key for us. And what's also key, and this is one of the issues that will come up later on, is about talking about issues of contingent liabilities and risk due diligence and so on with respect to uh, state-run enterprises. Um, before I joined in 2005, I was a senior advisor in the government of New Zealand working on uh, things related to public sector management uh, and central government. Um, the, the topic itself is very important, responsible business conduct. We, uh, to be honest with you, until, until I actually was going to be a part of this, uh, this, this, this meeting, I hadn't really thought too much about this notion of RBC and how it fits into the bigger picture of where SOEs are coming from. Um, of course, there are links to corporate social responsibility and a whole lot of other things, but if you were to actually look at RBC in the bigger context of where SOEs are headed, uh, it will give you a better idea of the, the enormity of what's at stake. Um, now look, we all know about sustainable development goals. Uh, the 17 goals altogether are going to cost trillions of dollars. Just on, on investments alone in, in infrastructure, um, Asia itself, Asia and Pacific will need about a trillion dollars a year. Uh, we don't have that kind of money. The money has to come from somewhere, and governments aren't going to be able to do everything in the economy, much as they may or may not want to do. So increasingly, they're going to be relying on state-owned enterprises, and these are state-owned enterprises that are defined in different ways. There's those that are fully owned by government. There are those that are, you know, in, in terms of the, the mix of ownership. Uh, and the way we've seen it in ADB, increasingly, there's a very strong realization that we need to start thinking differently about how we engage with uh, with SOEs. Um, and across Asia right now, there are countries that have actually started to rethink the way they work with SOEs. So in countries like India, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, uh, Vietnam, we have governments that, have, that, that tell ADB uh, we're no longer going to be guarantors of loans that state-owned enterprises take. There are state-owned enterprises that are really very rich. Their balance sheet is very strong and they really don't need to borrow money from you know, entities like ADB at, at low cost. 
because uh, if you think about it, the LIBOR is about 2% now, and if you add you know, the, um, the, um, the extra cost of you know, taking a loan, um, the, the basis point is about 0.4, whatever it is. You're not going to be, you know, this is cheap money that these state-run enterprises are getting. But for governments, there's, a, there's an issue of having to provision for the loan in their budget, in the contingent liabilities, and governments are saying, we don't want to do that. So there's a certain way we have begin to rethink about how we engage with SOEs in these countries. And that's where RBC comes in. So it, it, it's very interesting to hear, uh, you know, national stock taking practices in Korea, in Cambodia, in India, uh, to get an understanding of where things fit. Um, there are other issues you will see in the, uh, in, the, in the document that OECD has given about things related to risk-based risk due diligence, of, of competition, of, um, you know, everything that has to do with how SOEs work as businesses. Uh, and, and that's a critical part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I have three colleagues, as I mentioned. They've already been briefly introduced. Let me go a little bit into detail of their background so that you understand where they're coming from, and then I will, after that, pass on to our colleagues to, to make their presentations. Uh, the first up will be Dr. Si Kyung Song, who is the head of the evaluation uh, research team in the Research Center for uh, SOEs at the Korean Institute of Public Finance. Um, you've moved to Sejong now, right? You're based in Sejong, you're still in Seoul? Around Seoul. Around Seoul, okay. Because yeah, there's a whole group of government offices that have moved to Sejong. Um, he's also been professor of public administration at Dunkook University. Uh, he's been actively involved in all matters related to public financial management, government accounting, uh, performance management, and so on. Um, he's also participated in several government evaluation teams uh, um, and you know, uh, government evaluation committees, notably the evaluation team for performance evaluation of SOEs from 2015 to 2017. Um, Dr. Song has a PhD from Seoul National University, but I just found out before we began this that Dr. Song and I go back a long, long, long ways. Uh, I was at the University of Pittsburgh long before he was there as well, but we, we talk about where we were in Pittsburgh at the time because he did his PhD over there, or much of his PhD work, and I finished my PhD from Pittsburgh, so it's a small world. What's also a smaller world is we have um, a colleague from Cambodia, Ms. Uh, Im Yaim, uh, who has studied at, at Massey in New Zealand, and uh, that's a university that I'm intimately familiar with as well, because I used to teach at the Victory University of Wellington. But before I come to Ms. Yim, the second speaker will be uh, Mr. Vickerman, who is the Director of Human Resources at NLC India Limited. Um, and you'll see India Limited is uh, Navaratna CPSC. We've been hearing about the term uh, Maharatna, Navaratna, and uh, Mini Ratna, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this ranked at the top of the echelon of central public sector organizations. He can, he's a mechanical engineer by academic training. Mr. Vigman is also a fellow of the Institute of Engineers uh, in India. Uh, he's won several awards in his role at uh, NLC, and he's had a professional career you know, uh, dating back more than 30 years. And we look forward to hearing his views on RBC and, uh, and SOEs and corporate governance. And um, going third will be Ms. Uh, Yaim Chem, is the head of the corporate governance division, as we heard, under the Department of Securities Issue and Supervision of the Securities and Exchange Commission of Cambodia. Uh, she's been at the SEC for about eight years now. Uh, Ms. Im has a academic work done in areas of finance, as I mentioned, at Massey University. Um, and she also successfully completed the director of the director's certification program at the Thai Institute of Directors. So we've got colleagues with us that uh, are in a unique position to talk about this issue of RBC and how it all fits in. So the way we've got it structured, we have 10 to 15 minutes of presentation each from all of you, and then uh, after that we'll open the floor for questions and answers, and hopefully we'll be able to get a little bit more, sink our teeth into what is it that this notion of RBC is and how is it that we can then use that as a way of seeing where SOEs are supposed to go. So, Dr. Song, we begin with you. Good afternoon. Um, it is my honor to, uh, to present at the front of uh, distinguished members of OECD ASEAN Network. Um, uh, before I start uh, my presentation, uh, you can find a book like this. Do you find? Yes. Uh, uh, titled uh, Public Institutions in Korea 2018, uh, which is, is published last week. So it is very hot. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, uh, uh, you can find uh, some information, uh, including our 
governance uh, and the evaluation system and each public institutions. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, today I will uh, present uh, Korean performance evaluation system uh, with uh, recent development in terms of ensuring RBC. Mm. Korean government, I mean the Korea, has an umbrella legal uh, system which is act on the management of public institutions. Uh, the law set the designation and classification of PIs. Um, at this time, we have 300 38 public institutions uh, divided into three types, uh, public corporations, quasi-government institutions, and other public institutions. Uh, public corporations are big fishes, like uh, uh, Korea Electric Power Corporation and Korea Expressway Corporations. They are huge and uh, relatively small uh, public institutions belong to the other public institutions. They are very small. So our evaluation, evaluation system is distinguished by the size and the types. So evaluated by Ministry of Economy and Finance, uh, they, I'm the the MOEF evaluate the major uh, public institutions, but others, I mean the small uh, institutions are evaluated by the, their own uh, line ministries. Many, uh, our performance evaluation system is uh, handled by the uh, Ministry of Economy and Finance. As an agent of the people, uh, the government uh, the initiate the evaluation. Um, the evaluation system was composed of three parts. I mean, the institution itself, and CEO, and senior auditor. Uh, from uh, 2019, uh, CEO's performance evaluation was, will be uh, merged into a public institution's performance evaluation system. So uh, next year, we have two evaluation systems. It's a little bit complicated uh, process and structure, uh, but the you see that the center, I mean the MOEF and KIPF, um, that they are the major uh, players in evaluating uh, public institutions. Also, you can see the ownership steering committee, which is set by the, our law, I'm the, the uh, uh, act on the management of public institutions. Uh, guide the performance evaluation and make decisions on the evaluation. And also KIPF, actually I'm working on uh, the research on the performance evaluation system. And also we changed the, uh, our, uh, some detailed index and the performance evaluation index and weight and also how to evaluate and how to compose the uh, evaluation teams like that. Um, okay, uh, it's a kind of cycle and the evaluation is uh, mostly uh, we uh, start the setup and report and evaluate. I'm the setup uh, the indicators and target the goals are set by the MOEF and the uh, uh, KIPF and report by the uh, public institutions. 
and uh, evaluated by the uh, KIPF and MOEF, also the evaluation team. It's like a cycle. Every year, we uh, evaluate the performance of uh, public institutions. Then, uh, one of the key uh, factor of evaluation system is the feedback. I mean, the, uh, the result should be feedback to the public institutions in terms of finance and also in terms of the, uh, the dismissal or um, the sustained CEO or the, uh, the employees like that. I mean, the performance-based compensation for each employee in public corporations, it is huge money is going on. I'm the, based on monthly salary, I'm the, if you get A grade, you can receive the 200% of monthly base. And also, uh, the, if you got E level or D level, CEOs could be fired by the government. So the feedback is the, one of the key factors in the evaluation system. Um, recently, our uh, the value system, I mean, the, in the evaluation um, was changed. I'm the, from the biased, biased means uh, we put more values on the profit stability and efficiency, which is the, uh, the former administration uh, put more weight on the, uh, this value. But recently, our uh, new government, I mean the new uh, administration, uh, tried to put more weight on the other side. It's a kind of responsibility. And, um, uh, social value. Um, you see it this way. I'm the, if you uh, put more weight on the uh, profitability and efficiency, you can not support the innovative enterprise. If you uh, 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 just look at the profitability, it, it's very hard to support a small business. So we try to change our value system. Recently, I think you heard about uh, our uh, former president's uh, impeachment. You know, the President Moon's administration was built by the civil movement. The former president was impeached uh, last year, and citizens asked uh, uh, more social values as a customer and as a owner. Also, we have lots of wicked policy problems, like uh, decreasing birth rate and aging population, and also um, low economic growth rate. They are very wicked problems. So uh, the new administration and citizens asked public institutions being more responsible in terms of transparency, accountability, and sustainability. So our evaluation system is one of the key factor, the system administration and citizen asked to change. So you can say, uh, recent policy direction is based on the people oriented. So since the last year, our performance evaluation system put more weight on the social values. Every public institution um, should change their strategy 
and the, their uh, business system uh, for creating better social values. I mean, the performance evaluation system has been changed. Uh, in setting 2018 uh, performance indicators, actually, which is uh, evaluated in uh, 2019, evaluation indicator design team weighted more on the effort to promote social values and its outcome, rather than the effort to increase profitability or efficiency. Uh, this year, our uh, performance evaluation team degrade the evaluation result if, if public institutions has uh, some social troubles like uh, recruiting corruption, violation of gender e equality, minimum wage, and employment discrimination, and tax evasion, eva evasion like uh, corruption and uh, some socially uh, uh, the big problems. So uh, this year, uh, some pu uh, public institutions are degraded, actually. So you can see the uh, performance indicator uh, changed uh, since uh, last year. You see the strategic planning index, which we asked, uh, balance between efficiency and social values in making the effort to establish management goals and strategies and each outcome. Also, you see the many other index, like uh, creating jobs, uh, equal opportunity and social integration, safety, environment, also labor management relationship. I mean, uh, we Korean government had tried to make public institutions more responsible with changing our uh, performance evaluation system. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Song. Um, there was one particular slide that I'll come back to you in, with respect to questions because I thought that was very interesting. Right. Mr. Vigoron, over to you now. Compliance requirements governing the state-owned enterprises in India. In India, we have got number of organizations under different heads coming under central government control, organizations called Central Public Sector Enterprises, and organizations coming under the control of state governments. They are called state PSUs, and public sector banks and financial institutions. Trust and cooperative societies, the deemed government companies, and autonomous bodies and other regulatory authorities. These are all comprising various organizations representing state-owned enterprises. See the overview of CPSCs in India. Our Prime Minister Honorable Sri Narendra Modi ji has told during the recently held CPSC conclave that in one way the correct meaning of PSE, public sector enterprises, he meant profit and social benefit generating enterprises. That is what he redefined PSEs of this country. There are about 331 central public sector organizations in this country, out of which 56 are listed companies, which turn around U.S. dollars, 276 billion, which is 13% of Indian GDP. The overall profit stands at 18.1 billion U.S. dollars, deploying more than 11 lakh employees' workforce in these enterprises, and 
the contribution to the exchequer by these organizations amounts to 54.57 us billion dollars while the market capitalization is standing around 158.21 billion us dollars coming to corporate governance by these organizations where do they stand they stand excellently with 47% and average at 10% poor at 14% under construction where this disclosures are under construction is around 22% what are all the statutory requirements reporting requirements of these organizations in india they comply under four different heads one compliance under companies act 2013 the sebi listing obligations and disclosure requirements regulations and regulations issued by the department of public enterprises of the government of india and other statutory requirements they report in the form of ceo and the cfo certification board subcommittees financial statements auditor reports growth and strategy reports risk management reports csr reports and business responsibility reports these organizations report under different heads to the government of india through memorandum of understanding signed between the government and the organization and between the main company the stakeholding company with its subsidiaries and periodical review of the mou so signed between the organizations and the government by the department of public enterprises of the government of india then the corporate governance reporting is being monitored through the respective administrative ministries to which these public sector undertakings are attached to on regular quarterly and annual basis then other reporting requirements to different areas include regular reporting on project monitoring capex monitoring dividend distribution policy the parliamentary committees and subcommittees msmes and right to information act as regards companies internal monitoring systems are concerned the entire operation and the disclosure and the responsibilities are being monitored internally by the organizations through the board of directors and declaration from designated employees as per the code of conduct different types of audits held like internal audit statutory audit secretarial audit cndg audit special audits and performance audits apart from that the companies are monitored regularly by different parliamentary committees involving people's representatives coming over to the organizations and review their performance and ensure that they properly maintain and ensure corporate governance apart from that we got our prime minister's office finance ministry ministry of corporate affairs department of public enterprises and the respective administrative ministries also take care of the internal uh monitoring system beyond everything we got five cs they are called cag cic the cvc the cbi and the codes through all these five cs the organizations internal uh, performance and other compliances are closely monitored sorry mr vikram could you please let us know what those abbreviations mean so cag i assume is the auditor general ah 
What's the CIC? CIC means Central Information Commission. Okay. That and is that is disclosure of all information under Right to Information Act. Okay. He is the authority vested with the powers that is called the Central Information Commission. Okay. And then the comes CVC, Central Company. Vigilance Commission. Okay. CBI. Then comes CBI, Central CBI. Bureau of Investigations. Oh, I see. Okay. It's, it's this one. Then our courts. These are all the five C's governing the conduct of our companies in this country. Despite a lot of monitoring mechanisms and the reporting structures, disclosures to be maintained maximum in the public domain, the government thought it fit, still there needs a lot of improvements. So accordingly, a committee has been constituted under Uday Kotak, and the committee has gone through what is existing in the country regarding corporate governance reporting, how the companies are disclosing, what are all the informations available in the public domain transparently to all the stakeholders. So a set of recommendations have been made by the committee and the key recommendations are already listed in my slide and left side which are all already accepted by the Stock Exchange Board of India, SEBI. Main recommendations include the disclosure of expertise and skill of the Board of Directors, including how they could be disqualified, how they could be debarred, what will be the way to deal with the resignations. Then comes the disclosure on board evaluation. See, we got a system in India where the board is governed by the regular functional directors and independent non-functional directors. The performance of the board itself is being evaluated through the independent directors who are on the board, how the functional directors function. So that evaluation is not made public in the public domain. And the committee has recommended that whatever be the uh, evaluation made by the independent directors of the company regarding in the performances of the company, the performances of the regular and functional directors, that has to be made public, not only made public, whatever be the content, whatever be the uh, content made in the report previous year, and what is the action taken by the company on the recommendations, evaluation? And what is the present one? What is the way forward in future? That also to be made public in our public disclosure. So that is a, another beautiful recommendation made by the Kota Committee, which is accepted and in the process of implementation. Then comes disclosure relating to related party transactions. So far, all related party transaction disclosures are made only relating to the parent company, not relating to its subsidiaries or joint ventures. Now that the committee has made it mandatory through its recommendations that including the parent company, holding company, the disclosures relating to third party transactions relating to its subsidiary should also be made public. Then comes certain reforms relating to secretarial audit, credit rating, searchable formats in which the disclosures are made public, the annual reports to be made not alone in a distributable hard form, it should be made public through soft copies in the uh, uh, net of the company. Then comes a vital recommendation relating to changes in financial ratios to enable the investors and stockholders of the company's financial decisions the committee has suggested to include key financial ratios which were either to confining only to the company's review by the board it has not been made public through its disclosure the committee recommended that these key financial ratios 
like debtor turnover, inventory turnover, interest coverage ratio, current ratio, debt equity ratio, operating profit margin and net profit margin should also be disclosed, placed in the public domain to, more, to make it more transparent. Then comes medium and long term strategy. The company makes a lot of strategies, but those strategies are not finding fault, uh, part in our disclosures. So this committee has made it mandatory for each company to make known to all the stakeholders about what are all the long-term and short-term uh, strategies of the company. Then comes major recommendation relating to audit. While auditors are reviewing the performance of the company, if there is any disagreement, if there is any qualification on um, 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 finding, find, found out by the auditors. Normally, the same is replied by the company. They get the clarification from the company. And based on the replies to the qualification made by the auditors, the same is not finding a place in the final report. Despite the fact that the auditors have their own reservation to accept the management's uh, decision, but this process is not finding a place in our public domain disclosures. So the committee wanted that to also be made public. Also, another recommendation is that in case the auditor finds that the reply is given by the management of the company regarding their qualification is not appeared to be acceptable to them, they can appoint a third party auditor also so that uh, at the cost of the company, they could, they could uh, at the cost of the company, they will evaluate their stand and whatever be the recommendations of the third party, that is to be made public in the report. That is a beautiful recommendations to make it more public uh, oriented disclosure in the form of transparency. Then certain recommendations made by the committee has been accepted by the government with minor modifications. Then certain recommendations have already been sent to the government for acceptance, particularly relating to the public sector organizations where the recommendations have been, uh, the government has been requested to strictly comply with the regulations and requirements at par with the governance standards, harmonization of the legislation in case of inconsistency in line with the CB regulations. So that way, the recommendations have already been forwarded, government is acting upon. We have come to what are all the challenges in making our business more disclosure-oriented and transparent. Whether the fair disclosures satisfy the requirement. The disclosure should not only satisfy the requirement of law, but should go beyond. That is, the spirit of law behind such legislation should be kept in mind before making it a fair disclosure. And whether the transparency reflects the insight of the management. May, you may be having something in your mind within the organizations, but you may disclose something differently. And the disclosures should be adequate enough truly reflecting the insight of the management of the organizations on the matters disclosed instead of merely complying with the disclosure requirements. These are all the challenges. And major challenge is that monitoring of disclosures and interministerial transaction regarding disclosures. This is not presently being done. The overall monitoring by all CPSCs put together and comparison of performance of CPSCs in the same industry has to be given valuable insight. Wherever the CPSCs are engaged in such inter-CPSC transactions, 
a common agency has to monitor the individual performance which is absolutely required. For example, see, a company, a public sector organization has taken up a major project involving the project is being constructed by another public sector. Both the public sector are not in the same administrative ministry in the same monitoring mechanism. While both the organizations stand alone appear to satisfy the monitoring mechanism to the respective uh, ministries concerned, interdepartmentally there are a lot of time overruns, there are a lot of uh, project uh, schedule skips which does not figure in the monitoring mechanism by the standalone monitoring of the respective ministries. There should be interdepartmental monitoring which has to be the major challenge for every organization. Then reporting of value creation, the shifting of focus to integrated reporting from existing reporting structure. The present reporting system is based on numerical values only, whereas integrated reporting system stresses on the brand and value created. So that way, instead of giving figures in your reports, you give what is the value added by the company through its process and performance. Then we got a system of getting the nomination of the independent directors on the board of the companies by the government. So there is a requirement to fill up, say, equal number of uh, directors at par with the functional directors, there should be independent directors. There is a regulation, but it does not speak about in which particular domain, which area of competency those independent directors have to be positioned in the company so that they will be truly reflecting, truly involving in the decisions and giving total insight to the company's board. So that is major requirement, is a major challenge. While for various compulsions and various reasons, uh, governments are in the process of uh, nominating independent directors, irrespective of whether their value addition will enhance the company's performance. So the major challenge is that the right independent director will be, if he is positioned in the board of the company, uh, he will give a beautiful value addition and improve the performance in the core business areas of the company. So finally, there is a lot of challenges in non-availability of independent directors. Many of the state-owned public organizations are not completely filled with the required number of board members. There are a lot of vacancies, particularly in independent directors area. So that challenge has to be made. Whoever be the people competent in the respective areas, they will have to be empaneled and enlisted. And depending upon the requirement of each organization, these independent directors have to be nominated without waiting for any time. This is the major challenge which these central public sector organizations, state-owned enterprises, are facing to make our business more responsibly conducted. I just wanted to quote finally before I end my presentation what that uh, committee headed by Uday Kotak has said. We do believe that public sector enterprises are huge national assets. Significantly undervalued and it's a big opportunity to revalue and re-evaluate some of them as we are going for the future. With this small presentation, I thank you very much for having given me a patient hearing. Thank you. With respect to the transaction costs of monitoring, but we'll come back to that during the Q&A session. Uh, let me hand it over to Ms. Iam now. Over to you.
to be here. And today I don't prepare my slide presentation, so I just talk and give you all some um, overview of the public enterprise in Cambodia and also some challenges of the state-owned enterprise, but only in the areas of um, security sector. Sorry. Let me go through um, the overview of the state-owned enterprise. I will give you the brief background of uh, state-owned enterprise which have involved since uh, the civil war of uh, Pol Pot regime. Yeah. Since 1989, um, we have uh, at the time say 187 fully state-owned enterprise and this number is not last until 2000. Uh, 2000. Uh, uh, some are uh, privatize and some transform or sell to the private and we at the time have around 160 private uh, uh, company or some of private uh, state-owned enterprise and uh, till 2007 we have uh, only 17 uh, one seven uh, fully state-owned enterprise which is in uh, various industry such as uh, utilities telecom uh, port um, and some logistics. Up until now, in 2015, we only have uh, 15 fully state-owned enterprises. It has uh, currently operated in the Cambodia. So this uh, was dismissed of uh, the state-owned enterprise significantly due to the economic uh, uh, liberalization in the late, uh, in the late um, 1980s and in 1990s. So Cambodia government have saved the uh, economic um, practice and from the plan economic to the market uh, driving system. So this uh, big well have made a lot of changes to the state-owned enterprise and uh, we also have um, some um, challenges for this uh, state-owned enterprise. In the total, let me move to uh, the total number of uh, the state-owned enterprise, which is uh, 15 fully state-owned. Uh, we have um, three different types of uh, state-owned enterprise in Cambodia. One which is the joint venture, the other one is um, uh, public uh, enterprise with the economic characteristic, and the last one is state company. So these three uh, types of um, state-owned enterprise is account for the 15 fully state-owned enterprise right uh, currently uh, in Cambodia. And also out of this number, three of them are uh, going public. So they are listed in the stock exchange of Cambodia. One is Senu. Um, uh, uh, we will send will um, autonomous port, which is known as uh, sea port, and um, Phnom Penh autonomous port, which is river port, and the last one is Phnom Penh water supplies. This um, company has, um, I'm sorry, this enterprise has um, to comply with two different um, regulations. One, which is um, the regulation passed out by the um, line ministry and the other one is from the uh, SCCC. Um, in response to the corporate governance which is uh, practiced in Cambodia uh, for the state-owned enterprise, they, when they go public they will follow the one prakas is known as uh, prakas on corporate governance for listed um, public enterprise which is specific for SOE uh, that go public and we also have the separate practice regulation for the limited public enterprise uh, limited public companies which is the private company so these two are almost the same we only have some quite different which is uh, uh, the board composition and also some um, uh, new reform, like uh, we introduce new ideas in, into the uh, SOE practice, such as the uh, social corporate responsibility. And uh, we also try to promote the protections of the key stakeholders and also the uh, 
promote the ideas of uh, uh, equal treatment to all stakeholders. And the other regulation which is um, um, implemented by the state is called General Status of uh, Public Enterprise, which is developed in, 2000, uh, in 1996. And this uh, regulation is pretty old in themselves, and, but they already have the main concept of uh, corporate governance, which uh, provide the guidance for the board of director, what they need to do to maintain the protections of its welfare and also to maintain the social welfare for its citizen. Since the main purpose of this um, uh, state-owned enterprise normally uh, are protecting the interests of the people, so we try to promote the equity among our people and the poor can also receive uh, the uh, service, public service which is uh, acceptable to uh, all levels of uh, people in Cambodia. And this regulation also um, provides some, um, I mean, uh, give a very specific uh, role and responsibility to the board of director, what they need to do to, uh, to in order to make use of uh, the, the well of the state in the right uh, direction. And we also uh, have some, uh, mentioned some functions of the ministry, some line ministry, which in charge of uh, the operation of the SOEs. We, uh, we separate the power between the state and also the state-owned enterprise. But um, the board of directors of the state-owned enterprise are representative from the uh, line ministry and also some from the private itself. We also mentioned some um, composition in the board of directors in that law, uh, giving the numbers of the director uh, should not exceed seven members. And these members are uh, all from line ministry and also from uh, Ministry of Economic and Finance. And if they were to go public, they have to remove two members of this board of director and then replaced by uh, independent director and also one director which is uh, elected by the uh, private shareholder which is known as a director representative of private uh, shareholders. And these two directors are mainly act on the best interest of the private uh, entity. And we hope that uh, this, direct, uh, this director also contribute uh, value added to the growth or performance of the state owns. And not only this, the state owned if they, the state owned that go public also have to comply with uh, some existing law such as uh, the closures, corporate closure, they have to uh, maintain some uh, information which is uh, sh which should be available to the, the inter uh, to the private uh, in investors. So in this sense, it it's become quite a challenge for the state owned to distinguish what are the right full information that should be disclosed to the private, but uh, it's not completely different from the private company. The, the level of the information itself is just the same as those who are from the private. So um, let me talk a little bit about the framework of corporate governance for listed SOE. In, in this framework, we design as uh, similar to the OECD principle, which focus on the four pillars, such as um, uh, transparency, accountability, um, independence, and fairness. And we also um, spread it into different chapters. We have the chapter for directors, we have the chapter for shareholder protection, we have the, the chapter for auditing. So uh, the, comp the listed SOE have to, uh, for example, in the area of auditing, they have to uh, be audited by the uh, aggregated um, audited firm, which is uh, the firm that is uh, uh, licensing by the SOE, uh, some, sorry, by the SECC. So they have to pick uh, some uh, 
that are li on, on our list to, to do the uh, audit things service to the state-owned enterprise. So in this way, it can uh, make assurance to the uh, private sectors um, about their, the numbers on the financial statement or on their annual report. Yep. And not to mention, we also uh, introduced the, uh, the protection of the stake key stakeholders such as the creditor, the employment, uh, sorry, employees, uh, the um, supplier, the, client, the, the, the customer of the companies, something like that. And we uh, only give uh, some uh, mechanism or some policy which is needed for the li listed SOE that they have to uh, uh, establish. Let me move to uh, the key challenges that is the, uh, for the state-owned enterprise, but uh, I only focus on the security sectors. There's, there are some uh, challenges for the state-owned enterprise. One of the most uh, challenges for the state-owned enterprise is the uh, closer, just like um, the other country that they have pension. The uh, closer is quite challenging for them, so they. At first, it seemed like they, they do not know what to disclose, what information which is necessary for the uh, private investor. So we have the program to introduce, I mean to provide the training for the listed company to know what type of information that they should disclose. But our um, training is not mainly focused on uh, the, uh, I mean, it cover all the aspects of uh, important information which is necessary for the private investor to make decision. Uh, from my experience, I have um, working with um, uh, listed SOE. They have uh, done a very good job in terms of uh, disclosure in comparison to the public, uh, private companies. The state owned enterprise has a very um, strong commitment in providing the necessary information to the, the, the private uh, investor. So in this, in this case, um, we believe strongly that uh, state owned enterprise has um, a very, uh, it's going to have a very good performance in terms of um, transparencies, ensuring the transparencies. And the other challenges that the SOE have faced is the protections of the stakeholders, key stakeholders, right? And although this is a very interesting um, topics that we have uh, mentioned and have introduced into uh, today's um, discussion, but these uh, challenges is, uh, play a very important role in terms of uh, uh, the the reputations of the state-owned enterprise themselves. So they actually pay a great attention on the social uh, welfare, the community, the client, the um, employees. Some have uh, maintained, retained a good or highly performed staff that they have. And some um, try to I mean, maintain what they are right now, but uh, we still believe that uh, they 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 have done a good job to to improve uh, this um, policy in terms of protection of the key stakeholders. Like uh, in some uh, example, some state-owned enterprise they have uh, mentioned some uh, they have mentioned some um, contribution to the society to the community. Uh, on their website, like they um, try to uh, help the poor from uh, being starving, and then some are helping those who are in the flood, 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 uh, flood, flooding seasons, and some are trying to um, help or to give the opportunity to, to the poor community to have access to the education. And this is a very good uh, sample for, 
for the other uh, state owned enterprise and also for the other uh, uh, public, uh, so, sorry, uh, private uh, companies. So I hope that this information would, uh, would uh, give you some idea of uh, how the uh, state owned enterprise operate in Cambodia. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Um, um Dr. Song, in one of your slides, there was a, a picture of a plank and you had profitability and efficiency uh, being, um, you know, ov overshadowing the um, components of public service, SME support, social responsibility, and so on. Um, which then to me implies, of course, that in Korea, you're still continuing to focus on the, the notions of profitability and efficiency as being much more paramount than the others on, on responsible business conduct. Largely because you've talked a lot about how in Korea things have done, uh, have been you know, sort of moved towards uh, much more focus on um, the RBC side of things. And so if you would look at the, um, I think it was the third or the fourth one. Yeah, that one over there. So is it, would I be fair to say then that regardless of all the work that have been going on in the PIs, that you still in Korea have, an, uh, have a case where things of social responsibility, of environment, of safety, human rights, and all that continue to still not be the dominant uh, focus of the government? So is that a fair uh, depiction? I mean, well, yeah, yeah. I say that, that the balancing I mean, the, the uh, former two administration, the government put more focus on the profitability, but uh, this administration just tried to balance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the, uh, our idea and the policy nowadays. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That helps. Um, Mr. Vernon, I have two questions for you. One, uh, when you mentioned the five Cs, um, I sort of was thinking about uh, one of our speakers in the morning who had been talking about the amount of, just the number of sheer number of meetings that have been held where the person is spending a lot of time just attending the meetings. Uh, and as I, as I look at the five C's and just look at the, the sheer range of institutions that you have to respond to, are we, in India in generally, and maybe across other countries as well, are, you, are we getting into a situation where the transaction cost of doing business as a, as a corporate entity is so huge now that we're, we're, we're being sidetracked you know, side into thinking about how do you respond to parliament, to the auditor generals, to others, as opposed to actually getting things done? That's the first question. And then before I pass on to you, you said that the, one of the challenges, the last challenge that you mentioned was the non-availability of the required number of independent directors. And I thought, really, in India, of all the places where there are such, there's a, the pool of qualified individuals is so huge that you would really be short of qualified independent directors that they'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that one. You can use this one. Thank you. It's a nice uh, uh, question. Both, both of your questions are very nice. Well, thought of. The thing is that we got five C's governing the performance of our companies. They, these are all the guiding forces which all the entities in our country are responsible and to take care of their, their governance. Actually, these are all the bodies where They don't preempt your this one. Wherever the policies and procedures are there, performances are there, they are nothing but watchdogs. They follow whatever be your performance, whatever you put in. They will ensure that these are all within the boundaries. You don't cross your boundaries by making unnecessary, uh, uh, involving your board in other way. Not, not not uh, falling to the traps of uh, economic recession or not disclosing, keeping certain disclosable information secret. In the process, you wanted to hide something which will lead to corruption. These are all these 
watchdogs, five watchdogs, which are all five pillars of this country, enabling the organizations to have a better performance. So they are enablers, not disablers. So we are not bogged down by their uh, governance or their uh, watchful mechanisms. No, we, we, we enjoy and rejoice their questioning and we are, we are more uh, oriented towards their uh, boundaries. So this is number one. Number two, coming back to non-availability, what I shared is that in India, there is plenty of talents. There is no second thought about it. There is no disagreement at all. However, there are certain regulations governing who can be an independent director. We have a system of panel, paneling people from different walks of life. A bureaucrat who has served the company for 60 years. A chief executive of an organization who served six years in different public sectors. A great personality from politics. A great personality from the field of finance. Great personality in the field of audit. So all these people have been pooled and a panel of uh, uh, such uh, uh, eminent personalities have been kept by the government. As and when vacancies are arising, these people have been posted or nominated to the respective boards. But only problem is that the willingness from these people, those talented and who have a competency to further give their potence to the companies beyond their 60 years is gradually coming down. So that is the problem which these companies are facing. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks. Um, there's one question to me, Sam, before I open it up, and then maybe the others can also pitch in. Um, one of the things that's mentioned in the documentation provided by the OECD and the area of uh, RBC uh, is on um, risk-based due diligence. Now, um, I didn't hear this particular aspect come from the three uh, colleagues over here. Now, it may be because we haven't really had a chance to look into it in great detail, and that's why it's, uh, it was over, overlooked. But Museum, anything in the Cambodia experience where you're looking at issues of due diligence of the, uh, I think it's about 15 now companies are fully owned, uh, state owned, right? And there'll probably be 12 in the near future because three are going to be listed. Um, was there anything in Cambodia and maybe in, in Korea and India as well with respect to the notion of risk-based due diligence? How is it that you know companies, uh, SOEs in Cambodia, for example, uh, do they or don't they carry out and how do they do the risk-based due diligence? Any thoughts on that? Thank you for the questions. Actually, we didn't mention about the risk-based um, regulations at all. But uh, in actually, um, in our regulation, we also mentioned some risk management policy, which require the company to set up the policy. And this policy is also approved by the uh, board of directors. And we also have uh, the risk management committee, which oversights on the policies, uh, implementations of the management teams. And uh, in the future, we also mentioned uh, we also plan to uh, make amendment on the re existing regulation because on uh, corporate governance for the listed SOE, we're going to integrate this broadcast with the other broadcast for listed uh, public enterprise, uh, public company. So uh, we will have only one set of rule on this point. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Mr. Vikram, any thoughts uh, with respect to India? Uh, due diligence, is that an issue at all? Or? No, it's not. It's not an issue, okay. Dr. Song, anything in Korea? No? Okay. Can I open the floor then for questions, please? We have another 10, 15 minutes to go, so... Um. Just, uh, well, mostly an observation, but also a small question to, to Mrs. Chi from um, uh, Cambodia. But first, uh, a more general point, I mean, because listening to uh, the first three panelists and, and some of the discussions in this room, I sort of... Uh, I thought I would, I would try to draw a different distinction from an OECD viewpoint because we did a, a minor study, uh, what, five, six years ago, I think it's referenced in some of your materials, of uh, balancing the commercial and non-commercial objectives in state-owned enterprises. And uh, I would say in uh, core OECD countries, the dividing lines are drawn a little bit differently. 
I mean, there's first what you would call, I mean, purely financial and non-financial objectives that are communicated to the state-owned enterprises. And then secondly, um, there's responsible business conduct, which is uh, much closer to what a private listed company would do to be seen as a good corporate citizen and, and being branched into communal concerns and uh, avoiding excessive uh, pollution and things like that. And, and, uh, and uh, certainly in, um, in some of uh, our member countries, I mean, that would pride themselves on having good practices, they would say, and there I, I, I differ a little bit from Mr. Song from Korea, because what they would then do would say, no, the, the non-financial objectives, and that could be something like, look, I mean, we want you to provide so and so much electricity at almost no cost to poor households, and we want you to do this, and we want you to do the others. That's part of a performance evaluation package. But uh, then, True responsible business conduct, um, that is uh, subject not to performance evaluation, but rather to sort of an ongoing dialogue with the boards of directors and the management of these companies, kind of a, where do you stand, have you aligned yourself with the government's expectations, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, that, that's also impo important in the context of this weighing of profitability against RBC, because most pr Private, progressive private companies would say there is no trade-off because uh, companies that are seen to be good corporate citizens and uh, responsible to their staff and the environment, they are actually doing better, they are performing better, they are more efficient, they are more, more profitable. So I just wanted to throw out these ideas to sort of try and keep apart the non-financial objectives that can be measured and weighed and evaluated and then the more amorphous but equally important issue of responsible business conduct. Uh, this was my intervention and then the question uh, after listening to, to Mrs. Chi's presentation, now you're in early days of listing these state-owned enterprises, I understand that, but in a number of other countries on this issue, now I'm going back to perhaps non-commercial objectives. Uh, um, I have heard a lot of uh, private investors complain that, look, I mean, uh, uh, we invested in this minority stake in a listed SOE and we thought we knew what we were getting into, but all of a sudden the government uh, decided that this government should do this, that, and, uh, and the other in the public policy interest and, and uh, uh, basically behaving as in the days when it was still a statutory corporation cl uh, run closely to a government ministry and, and uh, really violating the interest of the minority shareholders. So I'm, I'm asking you, what kind of safeguards do you have in your system to, to prevent something like that from happening? As you know that the main objective of the state-owned enterprise is to maintain the social welfare. So otherwise it's going to be um, the, the, I mean, uh, make the different in the society and make the poor just become poorer. So. Uh, the investor themselves, when they try to invest in the state-owned enterprise, they have to understand that nature as well. So investing in the state-owned enterprise is the long-term investment. Though uh, the main objective, the main mission, the main vision is to uh, prosper the social welfare, but at the same time, they have to uh, sustain the um, uh, their, their performance as well, so otherwise they, they won't last long. But uh, in Cambodia, we have uh, uh, remaining 15 state-owned enterprise, which play a very important role in uh, uh, promoting the uh, social welfare. We, um, we provide, I mean, for the minority shelter, they have to comply with the existing regulation when they are listed, like uh, they have to provide the, the rights to redress whenever there are some uh, problem violating their rights, violating their interests. They can seek uh, for redress from the state-owned enterprise and this uh, will resolve by the uh, state-owned enterprise board of directors or maybe some clarification from uh, the state, uh, from the government who owns the partly own uh, state-owned enterprise. Um, that, that's all for my... Okay, if not, let me raise uh, two or three points um, that I think, as a way of summary, but it, it's actually really difficult to summarize things that cut across such diverse um, context, but 
The first thing that struck me was, of course, that we have heard from three different um, uh, you know, contexts, um, Korea, India, and, and, and Cambodia. And, and that's important, because if you're trying to learn uh, you know, from each and trying to ex expand that to see how it can be applied to other uh, domains and other contexts, uh, we have to be very careful about that, because policy learning does not you know, sort of carry over that easily. Uh, the best example of that is actually uh, something that the former Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, had been saying. There was one time in the um, mid-80s, I think it was, when he actually said uh, about this particular country, if I let you run my country, you will drag it to the ground. Uh, this was with respect to, you know, sort of how uh, in, in Singapore there's a certain way of managing the, uh, the public policy and political affairs. And you know which country he was referring to? He was talking about Australia. He was saying if the Australians were to run Singapore, they would drag it to the ground. Australia is a vibrant, democratic, you know, liberal country. Uh, the point there being that what works in one does not necessarily work in another. So if something works in Korea or India with respect to how corporate governance takes place and how RBC takes place, it doesn't necessarily mean that it can be carried over into Laos, Cambodia, Nepal, Bhutan, and elsewhere. We have to be very mindful of that. That's, a, that's one of the lessons in public policy that certainly in ADB we've been able to you know, keep that in a very uh, rightful context. The second thing is about transaction costs. And I do not wish to minimize this particular point when I raised it with Mr. Vikraman over here. For example, uh, we have right to information. Um, I used to be the senior advisor in the New Zealand government in, in the public sector. It's one thing to say it's very good to have right to information provisions where people and citizens can ask questions of the government officials so that they can hold them to account for what's going on. But the flip side of that is the transaction cost that it takes for the government officials to actually respond to these requests. Now, I understand in India you have uh, RTI provisions where the person that's making the request does not pay more than 50, 60 rupees. I have no idea how much it is, but it's not really a substantial. 10 rupees per page. Okay, because in New Zealand, I think when somebody makes a request, they pay about $50, I think. And I remember being subject to one of those RTI requests. And I had, I had actually gone on a trip to OECD, as it turned out, from Wellington. And somebody in, I, 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 it was probably from a newspaper, wanted to know which officials from the government at that time had traveled abroad and where did they go and what did they get out of it. And I remember actually spending at least half a day at least, maybe more, to collect the information so they could pass it on to this individual who probably had no other interest. I have no idea what he or she was trying to do with it. The point is, and in, in New Zealand, everything is information. The stuff that I've scribbled over here is information. The stuff that I might write in the back of an envelope is information. I send you an email, that's information. I talk to you on the hallways and, and somebody overhears this conversation, that's information. You're supposed to give everything. And to collate all that takes a lot of time. And if you have state-owned enterprises to whom these RTI provisions apply, and there's all this you know, transaction cost of, of actually responding to them, it is not something to be taken lightly. That's all I'm saying. I'm on this side of the fence now, so I can sort of ask for RTI provisions to be made. But having been a quote-unquote government official on the other side, I know full well what it means to be subject to an RTI request being provided. But that's something that, aren't you going to say something? <laughs> Yes, we guidelines in 2014, 2015. This was discussed at very great length. And uh, precisely the point you made was being made by quite forcefully by Mr. Sengen's uh, then superior from uh, Ankara. And, um, and the, uh, I think the compromise finding of our working party was to say, look, this is not just about corporate confidentiality. If a company is commercial or largely commercial, then you should not burden it with unreasonable information requirements because that actually creates an unlevel playing field tilted against the SOE. But then comes the antithesis. If a company purports to be operating largely in the public interest and carrying out public policy functions in kind of in the interest of the taxpayers and the general public, then it is reasonable to demand that this company, none, notwithstanding the costs, uh, take great care to tell the public what is being carried out in the public interest. That's very true. Yeah, no, it's good. Look, I, when I was in academia, I used to, you know, expound, you know, till the cows come home about how good a right to information act was. 
When I was in the public sector, I used to think this is not really the best way of use of my time. And now that I'm with the AGB, I go, man, no, no, we should, probably should have some provisions over there to make sure that government companies are subject to these things as well. But anyway, that being said, uh, thank you, Hans, for clarifying that particular point because it is an issue that I think at some point, you know, state-owned enterprises and indeed others will need to be subject to. Um, can you give a round of applause to our colleagues over here on the panel, please? Thank you, Dr. Song, Mr. Fickerman, and, and Ms. Aim. Thank you very much. Thank you. So please accept our sincere appreciation for such an interesting uh, presentation followed by wonderful uh, discussion.